What is up, guys? Teddy Cornwell here. Welcome to the Underdog Talk, where we dive into the stories of resilience, reinvention, and self-discovery. Today, we are joined by a true icon, and I mean that in every way, shape, and form. Not just in the world of football, but in the journey of personal evolution. I mean, he's a Heisman Trophy winner right off the bat, an NFL legend, a trailblazer, I mean, a man in the world of cannabis ad advocacy. I mean, beyond accolades, just so much he's done for this community and uh, this world. I mean, the one and only Ricky Williams. How are you doing today, sir? <laughs> I'm great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, man, I I love this story. And and did you ever think of yourself? I have to ask. Did you ever think of yourself as an underdog at all in your career? Uh, in my career. <laughs> you know, I, you know, I think there's a like an innate part of us that has to feel like an underdog. And so yeah. even if even if, you know, 99 percent of our life, right, we're the front runner. There's that one part that's an underdog. Um, so, you know, I was like, I was like, I was recruited by every college coming out of high school. So I can't say I was an underdog from that point on. But getting there, you know. Yeah. I was an underdog, and and I my first tattoo was was Mighty Mouse, um, because I I so connected to be to be an underdog. And my freshman year playing JV football, I actually was a middle linebacker, and you know everyone said he's too little, he's too small to play middle linebacker, and so uh, I was an underdog. <laughs> and I would even say kind of an underdog in, in, in the football sense as well in the national football league in terms of what kind of what you kind of went through and how you overcame it and now looking back back at it it is kind of a, a normal thing in usage and obviously you've been you know very vocal about your your spiritual journey and holistic approach to life kind of how has that influenced your life after the game of football and you know what advice would you give to a current athlete um struggling with life after football break Oh man, what a what a question! Um, before before I answer that question, um, I, I'm just thinking about your underdog question. And on the football field, like I said, I was an underdog when I was 15, 14, you know. Um, but on the football side, not re not really, not really since then. But what I'm doing after football, and I think this is what is challenging for a lot of athletes making the transition, is to have the kind of success and notoriety that we had as a football player to be able to do that in something that's not related to football, right? We're all underdogs, you know, because all the time people were gaining some expertise in some area of life, we were fine tuning our expertise in football. And unless you go into broadcasting or coaching, right, that expertise, right, you know, <laughs> it, 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 can't, it can't really do anything for you, okay? But what we learned about ourselves and about overcoming adversity, priceless, okay, priceless, right? And I think that's what we can, that's what I've utilized to, to embrace being an underdog and, and the things that I'm doing now, which, like you said, is health and wellness. And, you know, when, when like, my, my main modality for health and wellness is, is, is astrology, you know, and, and it's not like what you see in the newspapers, it's something, it's something much, you know. <laughs> much more profound than much much more profound than that but when i meet people and i and i let them know that i'm a healer and my main modality is astrology right they have a difficult time orienting themselves to that definition of me where they're stuck in the football version of me and so in the sense of being successful in the things that i'm doing now that i'm most passionate about 100% i'm an underdog so but like i said i'm using everything i learned in football to to face the adversity and and to to eventually rise to the top, and I think to me your journey into astrology is <clears throat> quite quite simply fascinating. Now, Ricky, how has ast astrology helped you kind of understand yourself better, uh, and, and then what role does it play in your day to day life? Yeah, so you know, uh, I think of my day to day life for twenty years, almost twenty years of being a football player was every every Wednesday we come in and the coach hands us a scouting report and a game plan. You know, this is who we got this week and this is how and this is how we've decided we're gonna go, we're gonna go get after it, you know? And if 
And if we've done a good job in, in scouting and we've done a good job in the game plan and we execute, then we are victorious, right? So literally that was beaten into my head. And, you know, and so as I found astrology, that was the backdrop. And so when I when I looked at an astrological chart and started to understand what it represents, I was like, "This is a scouting report." <laughs> you know? I was yeah. like, "This is this is a scouting report and a game plan, right?" And a big part of the scouting report was the self scout, right? We need to know who we are. We need to know what we do well and what's going to be effective against this opponent, you know. And I think whether it's football or whether it's life, people waste so much time and energy trying to be something that they are not. And so even if you have the best game plan, but it's not based on your skills and your abilities, you're going to fail, right? So in order to have a good game plan, yes, you have to get a sense of what the opponent is going to do. But most importantly, you got to know yourself. And so I, as I found astrology, it dawned on me how much time and energy I was wasting on trying to be something that I, I, I'm not, something that I wasn't doing, something that I wasn't built for. And it allowed me to stop wasting the energy on those things and to start to focus on the things that I was built to do. Because it's easy, right? Everything requires effort, but it feel, it's more meaningful. That's the word I'll use. It's more meaningful when you're putting effort in a direction to become who you were truly meant to be. It feels draining, right? When you put effort in trying to be something that you were not meant to be. And if we're trying to find out what we are meant to be by the people around us, good luck with that. You know, good luck with that. It wasn't until I found astrology that it helped me tune in to connect to my inner sense of what's real and what's important to me and what I'm meant to be. And you've obviously kind of mentioned before how important self-care is and especially the mental health, you know, side. How do you, I think it's always important to be so open about mental health or so open about our physical health, and yet mental health is, is so hidden. Now, how do you, if you mind, talk about how to prioritize and, and balance your mental health in your everyday life, Ricky? Well, I think it's a, I don't think it's accurate to separate physical health and mental health. I mean, I think they, they're, they're intimately connected. It's just that if you're not taking care of your mental health, it just takes a while sometimes for it to manifest as harming your physical health, right? Just because you can't see it. But stress you know, it's, it's, it's a killer. So, you know, and, and so it's funny. It's, a, it's an interesting conversation talking to football players or masculine men about mental health. Because on one hand, right, the, the stereotype is that men are so tough. You know, they don't talk about their feelings. It's not about us being tough and not talking about our feelings. Is that we haven't been given a vocabulary to talk about our feelings. It's not that we don't want to or that we're not able to. We don't have the words or the vocabulary to do it because that's not part of our cultural training. Mm -hmm. you know? So, but but if you, the other side of it is in order to be to survive a football season, okay, you have to be mentally tough. And mentally tough means I don't I block everything out. It means I feel what's going on and I have the ability to meet the challenge and adapt to it. So so to me, and this is why I love astrology, because it's given me a language and it helps me provide other people with the language to be able to understand what's going on. Wow. I never thought of it as two different, you know, I always thought of it as two different parts. But when you put it like that, Ricky, yeah, it is really just one thing and it can affect each other. But it is, it is one thing at, at the end of the day. And man, I think you're so accurate on that, that, I mean, these big, tough people are you know, they, they should be open because I think it, it it's a normal human emotion. And obviously, um, I, I also know that you're a man of faith. How has kind of faith, you know, been an integral part of your life? And, and when did you find your faith in, in your journey, sir? So I was born into a religious okay. family. So I, it's like, when did I find it? It's like, it's, it's, okay. it's, always, it's, always, it's always been there. But, I, I you know, but the idea, right, was something we're born into, right, it's, if we think of I'm an adult now, or I'm a grown ass man now. So whatever I was born into, my job was to evolve it. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I was born into the Christian faith. But I got, you know, when I hit puberty and they said I have to wait until I get married, I was like, eh, you know, it doesn't work for me. So I had to find a, I had to <laughs> I had to find I had to find a faith or a walk of life that more resonated with the things that were important to me. And I and I searched and I searched. And this might sound weird, but for a long time, 
my faith or my religion was football. And, and if we and if you've ever been around a football coach or a football team during a season, right? It's like church, you know, the coach is up there and he's telling us his philosophy and how we have to be all together and what we have to do. And if the team buys in and they have faith in the coach and what they're doing, that team is successful, right? So that was that was my faith for a while, but that faith was kind of hard on the body, you know? And so I got to a point where I needed to evolve, evolve my faith. And that's when I found astrology. And, and it's not that I have faith in whatever my horoscope says. <laughs> yeah. It's it's more that I have a, a, the ability to find something that is faith worthy. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like one of the things that we can believe in, all of us, okay, is that the sun is going to rise right. in the morning, right? And we right. can all have faith that if we live up north, when January, December comes, it's going to get cold, okay? And if you live in Texas, when May comes, right? It's about to get hot, okay? So <laughs> I, right, we can have faith in those things. And I think when we learn astrology, that's really what it is, is learning how to track patterns and to see how things actually work so that our faith is aimed in a, in a direction that actually leads to, to more fulfillment and more happiness. And, and, more than I agree. <laughs> yeah, I think that is, again, I mean, it's mind blowing and eye opening. And obviously, you know, a, a big thing is I think you were, you know, going into another subject. I think you were way ahead of, of the cannabis time. And we had Eugene Monroe on the podcast. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, but he was obviously is still a big advocate for it now. And that was kind of my first eye opening to the benefits um, of of marijuana and what it can do for the body, especially being a football player where it is the toughest sport on earth. Uh, I think that's just how we can say it. Um, You know, how do you view the current state of cannabis in in sports and what do you still think needs to change, Ricky? Well, I mean, you say current state, but times are always changing. You know, if we go back 20 years when I got in trouble for it, times were very different. So from the point of view of 20 years and uh, 30 years, 40 years. Wow. 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 Right. How much, (laughs) how much things have changed. And then we can think in the next 10 years and the next 20, things are going to keep on changing. So I'm not really here to judge the change. I'm here to observe it and hopefully participate in it, but it's coming. It's coming. And, you know, obviously your brand Heisman uh, promotes cannabis as a way to kind of achieve peak performance, especially for athletes. Can you talk about how you've seen cannabis positively impact athletes? So when we say, especially for athletes, I want to clarify, this is anyone even who's played little league, right? Because, because there's something about when you put yourself in a, in a, in a, sports context, right? In a lot of ways, it accelerates the types of experiences you have, you know? Mm-hmm. Meaning if you take if you take a kid who, right, for whatever reason, doesn't go towards sports, you know, they go towards another area or maybe they just play video games at home, right? There's certain stressors and ups and downs that they're not going to experience just playing video games. But when you start playing football literally, right, you get hit in the mouth, right? And you have to figure out, <laughs> you have to figure out, Okay, what what do I do now? So it excels, right? And you have to work together with the guy who just hit you in the mouth. He's, you know, so you have to figure out a whole lot of things that are kind of intense, you know, and 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 so those things those things have definitely had a had a huge effect had a huge effect on on my life in the way that I in the way that I do things. So so. For people to understand what my cannabis brand is all about, you have to have been through some stuff, mm-hmm. you know. Because even the idea of performance, when things are easy, right? It's not really a performance, but when things are hard and you have the ability to find that inner the inner resources to meet that challenge and overcome that challenge, right? That ah, it's a beautiful thing. But like you were saying, right? It, it takes a lot out of you, you know. And if you don't have the ability to rest and recover and recharge and and keep keep the vision open you know this is one thing that I, people don't talk enough to me when it comes to cannabis they don't talk enough about it right i think of the healing potential of cannabis i mean whatever i'm not a biologist so i i don't know what's going on with the body okay but i know what my experience is okay and i know that when i consume cannabis that it opens up a vision that I didn't have before I consumed cannabis. Mm-hmm. And to me, that vision is what is extremely valuable, 
And, and I think of a, heal, a healing capacity, right? A, a healing situation is someone has been diagnosed with cancer, okay? Ooh, right? And they start going online and reading the stories, right? And they start getting right, heavier and heavier and, oh, okay? And then they smoke a little bit, right? To eat, to help them eat because of the chemo, right? But when they smoke, they start to imagine themselves getting better. Mm -hmm. mm. Ooh, okay? That's powerful, Right? Because if you can't imagine yourself overcoming something, you have very little chance of doing it. Yeah. And, you know, we had Jake Plummer also on our podcast, who's a huge advocate for CBD uh, and, and the benefits that brings too. And I think more people need to understand the benefits of it. And I think it's still stigmatized to a point. Obviously, it's becoming federally legal in certain states. Um, but I still think there's so many health benefits to it. Now, you obviously kind of started. I, I, I saw that you started in high school a little bit, didn't really, really like it. You then found your love for it. Was there a particular strand or anything that was that one for you that kind of eye opened you to marijuana? To me, it's not the strand. It's the, it's the, you know, they say set and setting. Okay. This is part of the psychedelic research. Okay. It was, it was the mood I was in. Right. And it was the, it was the timing of it. You know, it's the timing of it. So I was going through a, a really difficult time and a friend of mine slid something over to me. And this is where I, what I just said, right? I was just focusing on all the negative stuff. And when I smoked a little bit, I went upstairs and laid in the bed and I started visualizing and positive things, seeing things turn around and things change. And I, I, after that, I had back to back 300 yard rushing games. And Maybe it's a coincidence, but what happened in my mind is an association between letting go of stress, envisioning myself doing better, and then breaking records, right? Mm -hmm. And sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't erase that. <laughs> no matter what they told me, it was hard for me to erase that association. Would, would, would that have been 1998? That was 1998. <laughs> Yes. And that's that's part of why I call the brand Heisman because I yeah. I would not have won the Heisman if it wasn't for that day. Yeah. And if I had my head so far stuck up my ass, I wouldn't have done it. You know, it wouldn't have happened. And you've talked about again this uh, the, the self reflection that you must have gone through and kind of that solitude and, and embracing it. What role did you know solitude play in your growth? And how do you kind of self reflect in a positive way? Yeah. So one way to think of solitude, and sometimes this is the challenging part, is that when we're by ourselves, then we're by ourselves with our own thoughts. You know? And if we have intended our mind, right, there's going to be a lot of weeds and bugs and stuff. <laughs> it's tough. It's tough when we sit alone with our own mind. And so solitude can be lonely, right, because all this stuff is there and we have no one to help us distract ourselves. Yeah. So so that's the beginning part, but but once we start to make friends, we weed right because part of it is when you're aware of the weeds are, you know what you know where to get them, right? You know how to pull them. So once you get over all the craziness of solitude and you get to be alone with yourself, your deeper self, uh, it's a to me it's a form it's a way to recharge, right? Because when you connect to your deeper self, what you and this sounds cheesy, but it's real. When you connect to your deeper self, all you find is love. Right? And not because some fluffy, airy thing, but because the nature of life, if we don't love ourselves, we can't grow. Right? Right? Nothing grows without love. And so in order, it's built into us, deep inside of there. It's built into us that there's, there's like a little stream of love. But with all this chaos and all this stuff in our minds, we can't hear it. And sometimes in order to hear it, you do need solitude to, so that you can, because it's a whisper. Mm -hmm. It's a whisper. And it comes down to if you if you're not ready to love yourself, you know how can you love others? I guess in, in that in that term, and uh, how can you be your true version of yourself if you still have those weeds and stuff like that? I think that's truly an accepting you know, speech. Now, obviously, I'm not gonna we're not gonna skip over that uh, that uh, Heisman that you mentioned and, and that <laughs> 1998 season. Don't don't think we'll just glance over that. That 1998 season was pretty damn special. Obviously, going to that 1998 season, what flipped the switch for you? What was so different about that year that you just rode and shone? 
Well, I mean, it wasn't it wasn't anything really that that different. I mean, there's something different in all football seasons. But 1997, I led the NCAA in rushing and scoring. So it wasn't like it was. <laughs> well, look, look, hey, I, mean, hey, I, I I didn't want to cut you off, but I wanted to say, don't skip 97. <laughs> 97 was important. <laughs> yeah, and I, I I think in 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 many in not every way, but in a lot of ways, ninety seven was more impressive because mm -hmm. the team didn't perform. You know, we were four we were four and seven. Uh, it was it was rough, but <clears throat> but well, so what was different was the team played better. Oh, okay. you know, and, and I say the difference was was Mac Brown. And Mac Brown came in, and he was just so different from a previous coach, John Makovic, and what Mac did for the program at Texas. Um, and I mean this in a positive way, right? He was able to utilize my talent and my ability and the whole platform to really help Texas take off. And so we were just, we were a really good team, I'd say. But the football stuff, you know, I, I figured out college football. <laughs> I, I, and that's one of the, that's, that was one of the reasons I came back. You know, there's, there's something, this kind of confidence I had that senior year where no one had played more college football than I had at that point. Right. No one had touched the ball in all of college football more than I had. So I had more experience. I was bigger. I was stronger. I was faster than everyone. Yeah. And so I wanted to see if I could use that physical ability to to make a difference for the program. You know, because if I would have left as a junior, yeah, I would have had, you know, yards and I would have been a top five pick. But I wouldn't have made an impact or a difference on the program. And when I decided to go to Texas, one of the first one of the first things that was most important to me was that I go to a program that that is has a rich tradition, but they they're on their way back up and to be that missing piece that helps them get back on top. And I saw that my senior season as an opportunity, you know, and that's all you can ask for is an opportunity to do those things. And and look, as you see, I'm a Cowboys fan and you top Tony Dorsett. <laughs> <laughs> That had to be a great feeling. Be, you, you're over the number one, number one, and and hearing I can still hear Brent Musburger's voice yeah. <laughs> as you're rolling yeah. over all of those yards yeah. and getting that big touchdown too to break exactly. the record. Exactly. Yeah. So that's that's one of those plays. You know, as long as Texas lives, as long as Texas football survives, that'll be in the top ten forever. Um, so that, and that's what that's what I wanted my college experience to be, you know, to be memorable. And so it was it was great. And then what was it like actually winning the Heisman after grinding your ass off and I guess overcoming obstacle to a point but just being great? Yeah, you know, it, it's it's funny, like to, to me, and this I learned this from astrology, you know, because in in astrology, there's like certain rules that mean that there's going to be difficult things that show up in people's lives. And it, it's true, kind of, except when you apply it to football players, it doesn't seem to be so true because all of our training and coaches will say this. They'll say we make practice hard so the games are easy. So almost everything that we do in football is preparing us to handle adversity and to handle challenges. So it's hard for me to think of it as something doing something special. I'm just doing what I was trained to do. Mm -hmm. you know? And the kind of mom that I had, she, she prepared me. <laughs> My mom prepared me for the, to meet adversity. So I kind of think I, I was built to face adversity. And when there's not any adversity, I, right, I create it because that's what I was built for. And so and I, I think one of the issues that I see, again, from my professional football background is one of the issues in mental health is a lack of mental toughness. It's not so much that we're too tough and we don't talk about our feelings is that we feel sorry for ourselves and we feel like we're victims all the time. And to me, it just means you're in the wrong place, right? I think we all have the opportunities and the potential to be heroes, but we have to find out who we are, what we were meant to do before we can even get on that track. And that's something I've been working on. It's called the growth mindset. I think it's what you're alluding to, that growth mindset. And, and no, I, this is actually, this is, this is an interesting question. If you could teach a, a course on life lessons you've learned, what would be the core message you, you'd want students to walk away with, Ricky? About what I've learned is, yeah. 
is the most important thing in life is to be yourself. The world needs it, right? Mm -hmm. Ooh, right? And I do a whole workshop on how to do that, right? How to recognize when you're not being yourself and what to do about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Look, I, I came on here because I was, he told me Ricky Williams, right? So I'm thinking I'm, I'm going to talk about how you were drafted by the Texas Rangers, how the New Orleans, <laughs> the New Orleans Saints gave up their whole draft for you, right? I'm thinking of talking about 2002, you're the, the NFL rushing champion, right? And I'm more intrigued to talk more about healing and astrology <laughs> from talking to you. This is great talking to you. You're talking to you just shows how diverse you are. You know what I mean? Not just football, not just personal, but you got all kinds of things to talk about. I, I wanted to even talk about your number change when you were at Texas. Why did you go from 11 to 34? But yeah. we're talking yeah. about astrology. I want to talk more <laughs> about astrology. <laughs> yeah. But the, I mean, it's like the same passion I put into becoming a football player. I just put it into these things. And okay. So, and so that, that that's kind of what I was saying about the underdog. And I think, I was lucky, right? I got out when I retired in the first retirement. I got out and I found someone who knew astrology and helped me get a sense of who I was and what I was meant to be doing. And then I put all my energy in that direction. And the result is I, like, I get to do this for, this is what I do every day, right? I get to talk to people who appreciate my perspective and who, who, who bring it back to me. So my perspective keeps growing. I learn so much on a daily basis. Now I'm, I feel truly blessed. Now, I would normally ask you what it takes to become a football player in the National Football League. But again, I'm more like Phil mentioned. I kind of want to know what it takes to become an astrologer and what it becomes <laughs> to find your, your, who you are. I, I'm fascinated right now. Yeah. Uh, it takes the two things I would say is courage and curiosity. Okay. You know, and, and they, they go they go together, right? Sometimes there's things we're curious about, but then what comes up is all the reasons that, you know, what we might lose or what might bad might happen, you know? And so when the courage is powerful and the curiosity is like, whatever, I'll, the courage is I'll figure it out, right? I'll be able to, to it's worth it, you know? And then I think you, you're, on, you're on the right track. But, but also, you talked about faith. A, a word that I like to use that's related to faith is meaning, is meaning. No, and it, and to me, like that, it's like with, on a football team, right? We all know that our, we want to win, right? So we all have a shared purpose, and that shared purpose gives meaning to every single thing we do as a team. You know? And and that's what I loved about football, and I say that's what I missed about football because you get out into the world, and if you look for meaning, right, it's like uh, make a lot of money, uh, <laughs> take care of my family. Uh, which is great, right? But, you know, if I'm thinking of doing something that's hard and I think of why am I doing this and is take care of my family, like, yeah, it feels good, but it doesn't necessarily, like, at least me, it doesn't inspire me, you know? To, but I think it's something like to, to share stories and to have conversations with people that open their minds and give them more permission to show up and be themselves. Oh, man, right? I, I'll run through a wall for opportunities to be able to do that. I think you've done that. I'll, I'll speak for me and I, I probably speak for Phil. I mean, I, I feel like I've got some reflection to do and some, some stuff that I need to look into and yeah. ultimately become the true happy version of myself. Like you talked about now, um, obviously today, you know, it's happy. It's happy, but I think a better word is fulfilled. Mm -hmm. you no, know, because, cause I think, uh, I think when I was playing for the saints, you know, and we had a string I've had this a couple of times in the NFL. We had a string of we won six games in a row. You know, we were rolling. We were rolling. I was carrying the ball like 30 times a game. Okay. And after the game, I you know, I, I was happy we won, but I was, you know, in a lot of pain and I was tired. Okay. But I 100%, no doubt, felt fulfilled. You know, that meaning, right? The purpose of bringing me to New Orleans was for me to help them win games. And I was giving my all and accomplishing that. Fulfilled. Fulfilled. You know, and and I know I'm here on here talking about Heisman, but another right, and, and I have a deep passion for cannabis, but it's connected to everything we're saying. 
And another startup that I um, that I'm super passionate about is is an app called Lila L I L A, and I I created this app for this reason, right? To be able to scale these ideas in these kinds of conversations, and it's an entry point for people to start to get a sense of of who they are, right? Of what's important to them, of what their deepest their deepest motivations are, you know. And here's a simple image, right? We go through life and we learn that things are important to us or things make us happy or things inspire us that we didn't know inspired us before, you know? And that comes through meeting people or having new experiences, taking a class and being, I thought chemistry was boring, but I love this stuff or whatever, you know, whatever. And I think astrology just just speeds up that process, you know? It kind of puts you on the right track to giving you I call it timely food for thought, you know, giving you things to think about that open up channels and, and create a pathway to understanding yourself better. Mm -hmm. And can this app, is this app on the app store, on the Android app store? Both. Yeah, it's oh, in I, both. Mm -hmm. Okay, first five people to download that, send me a screenshot. We'll get you a $25 gift card out to you because I think wow. the conversation aspect is super crucial um, yeah. and engaging and uh, is it like tutorials? Is it, you know, seminars or classes? How is it run, if you mind me asking? Uh, it's really, it's really timely food for thought. So, so we have a section called my chart where it's giving the insight, it's giving people insights on themselves. And it's the way, the way it's written, it's, it's, it's words that get you thinking, right? You'll read it and you'll be like, oh, and you'll start making different connections. All right. And then we have a section called activations. And that's the, that's the fun part of astrology is you get to see when certain themes in your life are going to be activated. Okay, a simple example in astrology we have a planet called Mars, right? And we know from mythology that Mars was the god of war. Okay, and so it really is that simple. Someone going through a Mars time, you're going to notice you attract fights. You know, and sometimes you be like, "Wow, my wife." You know, like sometimes if I'm in a Mars time, I'm like, "Why is my wife in such a bad mood?" You know, but it, it's it's really there's it's a time of war, you know, and, and there's certain seasons. Right. This is, again, an astrological idea. There's certain seasons for peace and there's certain seasons for war. Right. And so someone going through a Mars time. Right. It's a message. The theme in your life is there somewhere in your life that you need to stand up for yourself. You know. Right. And if you don't, you're going to be bullied. Okay? And if we are aware of that, right, we don't kick the dog or take the stress out on someone else or project it onto someone else, right? We realize that there is somewhere in my life where I need to step up and, and, and express myself passionately. And then, right, it's obvious to see when that situation shows up and we write the game plan and the scouting report, right? We can be successful. So instead of having a fight with your wife, you can have really good sex, right? I'm telling you, it's wonderful. Yeah, and, and obviously, I know, guys, please go check that app out. Now, you know, my final question for you is, what was the transition from college ball to NFL ball? Was there truly any difference for you? What was that all like? It was hell. It was hell, you know? And, and, I, and I don't even mean the on-the-field stuff. You know, I, I think my stats, <laughs> my stats speak for the on-the-field stuff, but mm -hmm. the off-the-field stuff. You know, and this is this is where the things I'm talking about. This is where I, this is what I learned. Okay, I was built to be a college football player. I was not built to be a professional football player. You know, and and I had this insight the other day. My my three year old, he's got a pair of handcuffs. Okay, and he was hitting, he was banging the handcuffs on the chair. You know, and the handcuffs broke. You know, and he said my handcuffs broke, and I and I said, well, they weren't built to be banged against the chair. You know, and then it dawned on me, if you're using something to do what it's not built for, there's a good chance that it could break, you know? And so, and if I look at just the reality, right, if I look at college football, right, I didn't break. I soared. I took off, right? I went into the NFL and it was different, okay? I wasn't built for it. And I broke over and over and over again, physically, mentally. I mean, thank God I became stronger for those breaks, Okay. But but still, and I got this this awareness. So it was hell, right? Because I was trying to force myself to be something that I was not. Hmm. And ultimately, you chose what makes you happy, which I think is the ending message in in, in this podcast. And I hope people get out of it. If they're coming and make you happy, do it. 
I mean, I think that's that's the end of the thing. And I think also I do have to add, you were still an NFL rushing yards leader, but a hundred percent. But but again, right? I I said it right. The, the my son's handcuffs banging against the chair, right? right, right. He was banging. He was doing a good job banging. But it broke, and they couldn't do what they were really meant to do because they were trying to do something else. So this this is this is kind of taboo. But I'm I'm gonna bring it up. I'm gonna call it out, right? Okay. So we we can talk about being an individual and not being a sheep, right? If I'm in a group of people, right, and I talk about who in this group, right, is themselves, and who in this group is a sheep, how many people are gonna raise their hand when I say a sheep? Okay, zero, right? None, none. Okay, but think about this, right? Even the question you asked, okay, right? And I, I don't even think you meant it this way, but the question you asked earlier is what does it take to be a professional football player? No, and again, I don't even think you meant it this way, but right, we could say all the parents watching their little kids play football, right? They could all say, I want my kid to be a professional football player. All of them, okay? Sheep, sheep, okay? And even the idea of if we say, when I get into the NFL, right? The goal of all of us is to make it to the Hall of Fame, okay? Sheep, sheep, right? And anytime we have this goal where we think all of us should have to have that goal, anytime we say all of us should have sheep, sheep, right. okay? <laughs> right, because some people, like, and if, you, and if you look at Tom Brady's astrological chart, he was built to be Tom Brady. He was built. He was built to be a professional quarterback, right? You try to get him to do something else, right? Like a family person, right? Right? He might have trouble, but a professional quarterback, right? He he, he was you, built you, for. You it. know what? You might be on to something because Tom Brady wasn't that great of a college quarterback, right? Hundred percent. But as a professional, he the goat, maybe, right? Hundred percent. Right? I like your point. Yeah. And some people are built for both. Right. It, but right. We can't choose what we're built for. It's our it's our responsibility to be aware of it and to move in that direction. Right. But to do that. Right. We got to stop being sheep, 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 sheep. <laughs> I love when, it. when do I we love know it. what we're built for? Is there a time or is there a <laughs> <laughs> <that come naturally>? <laughs> Well. <laughs> Well, you know, it's like I was saying that that voice inside of love, right? That's that's what tells us what we're built for. When you're doing something and it makes you feel good, really good, right? That's a clue of that's what you were built for. You know, and so and but in order to get there, we have to suffer doing things we don't like when we're young. But if right, we all go through the experience, we have to right go to school. Ooh, man, right? Some people like it, but Right, we don't. But if we can find something in school that we love, uh -huh. I found football. Right, mm -hmm. if we can find something in school that we love, to me, that's the point. Right, that's that's the whole point. Because if you and I'm 47 now, so I'm I'm older. Right, so I, I have more life to reflect on and, and look mm -hmm. back. And one of the things as you get older is you realize that everything you did when you were young is preparing you for now. Mm -hmm. Everything. Right. And but when we're when we're young, we don't have the, the habit of thinking about one day I'm going to be older and and what am I going to be doing? And there's the things I'm doing right now preparing me for those experiences. And when, when I had that moment is when I got scared and I quit football because I started thinking about what am I going to do in the future? And I realized that what I was doing as a football player wasn't helping. <laughs> it was just destroying my body. So it was going to be hard to do those things. And so I was like, whoa, I got scared. I was like, I need to figure out what I'm doing with my life. Otherwise, I'm just going to, you know, waste away and destroy my body for nothing. You know, and that year away when I made that intention, that's when I found the seeds or the roots of all of the things that I'm doing right now. And, and everything <laughs> happens for a reason. I think that's, you know, I, I do you believe in everything happens for a reason, Ricky. Yeah. I don't have to believe in it because I live it. I mm -hmm. see it. I, 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 I show people how to recognize it. So it's, not even, it's not even a belief, right? It's an observation. Hmm. I, I didn't look at it that way until now. And it is an observation. And it is something that is happening constantly. And I yeah. guess the end message is don't be a sheep. Dog. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's kind of harsh, right? I, I'm not saying don't be a sheep. I'm saying recognize where you are being mm -hmm. a sheep. 
Mm-hmm. Right? This is not about it's not about judging. Where we we all had to be sheep, right? We all had to be a sheep in our family. Otherwise, they weren't going to feed us and love us. So it's part of the process. But part of the process is is right realizing that we were just a sheep to get fed by our family, but really we're all lions. <laughs> mm-hmm. that, hey, I like to hear that. <laughs> It's true. Hey, it's true. Hey, I, 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 I didn't right. want to cut you off several times, but I got a couple of questions to ask you, and I, I'll ask them real quick. Yeah. What did make you change from eleven to thirty-four? Um. So when I got, I was thirty-four in high school, and when mm-hmm. I got to Texas, um, there was somebody that was wearing thirty-four already. Okay. And my, and my first coach, John McAvick, he was real old school, so he's like upperclassman. He's like, I don't care if you're the number one recruit in the country, upperclassman. Or, or, and them. and then he's and he wasn't really big on changing numbers. And so when he got fired and Coach Brown came in, it was like a fresh start. So I said, okay, might as well take this opportunity to get back in 34. By the way, it remind when you wore 34, it reminded me of Bo Jackson. Yeah. <laughs> it just the way you run and everything, it just made me think that's Bo Jackson right there. And then with the baseball aspect too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That was, that was my idol. That was okay. My see, idol. I, yeah. we can tell we, you could tell just by your running style, yeah. running style. All right. And obviously you said, so when you said you weren't built for the NFL, you were built more for college. Obviously you enjoy college football better than pro football, right? Oh, hundred percent. All yes. right. That's how, that's how I know. That's how I know I wasn't built for it. <laughs> Because right. I was saying, right? The question of how do you know what you're built for is because there's a there's a love around it, mm-hmm. okay? And and I always loved football, but I didn't love the NFL. That's not really what I'm about. Right. It was a wonderful platform, but it took me a while to real to realize that's what I was doing it for was the platform, not the not the football success. Got you. All right, and all right. So here's one of my favorite college moments for you, right? I, and then you'll tell me your favorite. But mine, I grew up as a Nebraska fan, right? Back to Turner Gill, Mike Rozier, Irving Fryer, all of those guys, right? They won, I think, I want to say like 47 games in a row. Mm-hmm. And you guys went up there and, and beat them, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. I had to tip the cap to you that day, right? Yeah. <laughs> what was your favorite college moment? You know, it's it's funny. It's just, it's not the same game, but it's a similar theme, and it, okay. it kind of brings this conversation full circle. Okay, right? that game. Well, I think what made it so special is the record, but that record meant that we were underdogs. Mm-hmm. No, it meant that everybody, everybody that had come into Lincoln, everybody uh-huh. that had come into Lincoln for the yep. past several years before that were underdogs. Yeah, right. But so again, not the same, but the same situation. So on my recruiting trip. Uh, to Texas, I heard all of the guys talking about how big and bad Texas A&M was. And I think we beat them once in the past 10 years. Uh-huh. Okay? So it was like they, they kind of been dominating us for a while. Mm-hmm. And listening to the to the guys on the team talk, it's like the A&M players were all like Quentin Corriette. You know, they're all like 6'2", uh-huh. 240, run four twos. Yeah. Okay? And they kind of work. And they kind of work. They kind of work. They don't kinda forget work. that, Gwen. Don't exactly. He, he he was on that team. So we, yeah. we went to College Station my freshman year, and it was the last game of the Southwest Conference, and the winner of that game won the Southwest Conference. So it was kind of a big deal, a great way to, to end the conference with Texas and, and us playing against the Aggies. Yeah. And I was a freshman fullback, and they had the wrecking crew defense, number one defense in the country. Okay, I'm not going to lie, right? I was scared. I was scared. And they were intimidating. <laughs> And I remember we, we we ran a draw play on, I think it was second and long and on the 20-yard line. We ran a draw play, and they blitzed their way out of it, and I popped through for a 20-yard touchdown. And there was this moment of confidence where I felt like, you know, if I can do this against the best defense in the country as a freshman, right, I'm going to be okay, right? And I ended up as a freshman fullback, okay, right. ended up with 165 yards rushing that game, and we ended up beating them and winning the last Southwest Conference. So, so that's by far my favorite moment. In, okay, in- okay. Yeah. As a freshman, mm-hmm. and then at the end, wasn't that last game against them too? Yeah, it sure was. That was the last game. Yeah. All I'm right. Sure. With, look, with Brent Musburger, right? Yeah. You got it. <laughs> you got it. Hey, I, I have enjoyed this. When we get off of here, you're gonna have to tell me how. What do you follow certain people in astrology or healers? 
or is it just random? It's not random. I mean, okay. I, I think in order to, to me, and this is my personal okay. opinion. Okay? okay. I think in, in, in order to do this well, you need a lineage. You know, okay. Because there's so much stuff out there. Okay. Right? And I think it just it it consumes so much time to have to go and figure, but to find a lineage that you resonate with, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. where there's a track record of of a technique or a system that works. Okay. You know? And I think okay. trying that on and then making it fit you. So okay. I have I have mentors. You know. Okay. I have I have mentors. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I've heard of Jordan Maxwell, William Donahue, but I'm not sure if they're the same or anything. But yeah. This yeah. is this is great. This is informative. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, good. Oh, good. <laughs> informative. And now, Ricky, thank you for taking your time to come on the podcast. Now, before we go, the floor is yours. Where can we find that social media? What is that app again? What? Yeah, is- the app is the app is Lila L I L A, and our tagline is Astrology for Grownups. Mm-hmm. Mm. Um, and and I think what what we offer is timely food for thought. Right? And people ask, well, what's the practical use of this? Why do people pay for this? And we, we don't talk about this as being practical, but living a meaningful life is one of the most practical things we can do because it has built in it the motivation to deal with whatever life serves up to us. If, you know, It's like raising a kid is difficult, but if, when you can realize what your kid has the potential to become and how necessary you are as a parent to help them reach their full potential, then then parenting becomes so meaningful. So on those days where you're like, ah, oh, right, you can tap into something that gives you some energy to meet the challenge. And that app will be in the description below as well as Ricky's social and Heisman. Again, first five people to download that app and send us a screenshot. We'll get you a $25 gift card out to you. Ricky, it's an awesome. honor Thank and you. privilege. Guys, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe on this video. Until next time, the underdog 